Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Diego Rovetta. I'm the chairman of the EAG Local Chapter Netherlands, uh, and uh, I'm here to introduce you to this talk uh, this evening about distributed acoustic sensing for geoscience. Uh, I welcome also my co-host, uh, Yuri Brackenhoff, uh, who will take over in a few minutes. And uh, tonight, as usual, uh, I will uh, introduce the talk uh, uh, welcome the AGE community, uh, give you some uh, uh, information about uh, a little change that uh, happened in the board committee. Uh, then we will have uh, uh, a good news. Uh, so uh, Yuri designed a website for our local chapter and uh, he will show you uh, a glimpse of it. Uh, from the website, uh, you will be able to do many different things and uh, we are very excited for this. Uh, then, of course, the agenda of today, some uh, uh, house rules about using WebEx event, and finally, the introduction to the speaker, the technical talk, and the Q&A session after that. As usual, I welcome all the friends of the different local chapter, London, Perry, Oslo, and Aberdeen, but uh, tonight, especially also the local chapter Germany, uh, we have uh, a big number of attendees from uh, Germany the, uh, this time. So I welcome all of you. Uh, as usual, we are part of uh, uh, a bigger community, including the students, uh, docs, uh, uh, Aachen University students, and uh, also some other organization like the Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists that, that are often uh, joining us uh, in our virtual events. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we are always looking for uh, new people that uh, could help us organizing this event. Uh, you will find us on LinkedIn, each local chapter has its LinkedIn page, and uh, you can contact us also by email, and this is the list of the email of uh, these local chapters. Uh, from tomorrow, I guess, uh, you can also contact us through the website, and Yuri will talk more about that. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a, a big, a, a small change in our uh, board committee uh, members uh, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, Fairley left uh, his position as media officer and secretary, uh, but uh, luckily we found uh, a, a substitute, Elin Lentfar. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, Elin. Uh, she graduated uh, uh, in geophysics uh, and uh, she's currently working as an uh, innovation engineer at Fuglo. At Fugro. Uh, he worked with the GPR uh, during an internship with the Helmut's based Wave Solver uh, in her uh, uh, master thesis. And uh, now she's working on different uh, geophysical related topics, uh, in particular in seismic and wave uh, theory applications, applied geophysics and programming. Uh, Besides geophysics, uh, she's a fanatic amateur athlete, uh, handball player uh, for uh, HV Celeritas, and various other sports uh, uh, like running, mountain biking, and squash. So welcome, Elin, on the, on the board. We are uh, very excited to have you on board, and I'm really sure you will do a very good job there. And uh, uh, of course, one member is coming, one is leaving. So um, we have to say uh, bye to Ferle. Uh, she left because of personal circumstances. And uh, uh, she's saying, although short, uh, I had a good time working with all of you and wish you all the very best. And we also wish you, Ferle, uh, all the best in your personal and professional life. Um, after this uh, uh, introduction about this change in the board, uh, I will leave now the mic to Yuri, uh, that is uh, uh, taking over uh, with the, the website news. Uh, so please, Yuri, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Diego. Uh, yes, it's true. We have a new website. It's uh, eagelcnetherlands.org. Uh, here you can see uh the a screenshot of the landing page uh it is uh, the first website uh, we've created for this uh we ba we have basically four uh pages the home page where we just put the most uh, important general news about us we can uh, see a little bit about the board the events that basically contains all of the uh, upcoming events uh, for the coming year but also the events that we've had in the past in there you will also be able to find reports and the links to youtube for example and finally, we also have a contact page, which you can use to get in contact with us. 
And the idea of this website is that we will evolve it uh, as time goes on uh, and to uh, hopefully also make it a little bit more interactive. But uh, right now, if you have uh, any questions about uh, what's going on in our chapter, it's best to check it out. So uh, make sure you to bookmark it, eaglcnetherlands.org. All right, next slide, please, Diego. All right, so then let's move on uh, to today's agenda. I am uh, very pleased uh, that we have an excellent speaker today, uh, specifically Professor Andreas Fichtner from ETH Zurich in uh, Switzerland. He will be giving a talk uh, titled Fiber Optic Seismology in Volcanic, Glacial and Other Challenging Environments. Uh, that will last uh, around 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more, we'll see. And uh, at the very, very end uh, of it, there will be, of course, some time for questions uh, uh, to Professor Fichtner and some discussions, which we always uh, encourage you to participate in. If you have a question, uh, you will see that uh, in the bottom right, there's these three dots. Please click on those. You will see a little menu that says Q&A, and there you can submit your question. So please do it in the Q&A uh, section and not in the chat. That makes it easier for us at the end to compile the questions. Now, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Andreas Fichtner. He's a professor of seismology and wave physics at ETH Zurich. Uh, he previously got his PhD from LMU. Uh, he has also done his postdoctoral research in uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. And he, uh, he has a broad range of uh, interests, I would say the most uh, relevant ones are uh, based on computational seismology, both the theoretical and the applied part. He has, uh, his group has done uh, a lot of work with the new distributed acoustic sensing methods, but they're also working in other fields with metal materials or with medical ultrasound, for example. Uh, he has co-authored multiple books. He has uh, written numerous publications and he has received several awards just to name a few, the 2011 Kaiti Aki Awards from the AGU and the 2015 Early Career Scientist Awards from the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics. And the list frankly goes on, so uh, I can't uh, name them all here. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Andreas, and uh, I hope you are all as excited as I am for this talk. Thank you very much, Yuri, for this kind introduction and, of course, for, for inviting me in the first place. It's, uh, it's really an honor to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I have a little bit more than 30 minutes, um, but uh, That's stop, fine. Me. stop me when it gets too long. Do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, as, uh, as Yuri said, uh, the the topic of my talk is uh, broadly speaking fiber optic sensing and uh, particularly in environments that are so challenging that the deployment of dense traditional arrays may be, may be impossible, at least very, very costly. I would like to start with the picture that you see here on the title slide. This is actually me uh, carrying a fiber optic cable in the Alps onto the Rhone Glacier. So the Rhone Glacier is between that ridge on which I'm walking and the higher mountains that you see in the background. And we put the cable on the Rhone Glacier in order to record ice quakes and all sorts of other environmental signals. And, uh, and that statement already brings me to the first objective of my talk. And uh, what I would like to, to do in this talk is to, to answer the question, how can really standard telecommunication optical fibers actually be used as seismic sensors? Then the second, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing so? And what is actually the niche of, uh, of this technology where it really has an advantage? And then, of course, third, can this actually provide some new geophysical insight? Roughly, my talk falls into two parts. In part one, I want to show you a couple of case studies. So this will be a very applied geophysics, applied geosciences. Um, case studies of distributed fiber optic sensing, specifically in volcanic and glacial environments. And the second one will be more theoretical on emerging technologies that uh, perform integrated fiber optic sensing. And I will tell you later what that actually is. So part one, case studies of distributed fiber optic sensing in volcanic and glacial environments. And uh, this begins with a small overview of what we call 
distributed fiber optic sensing. So this is, I think, how it should be called, but more frequently, you will find a misnomer, distributed acoustic sensing, even though we are, of course, not only sensing acoustic waves. And in short, this technology is called DAS, and I want to show you briefly how this actually works. So the basic idea behind DAS is that a laser interferometer called an interrogation unit sends a laser pulse into a pretty much standard fiber optic cable or actually into a single fiber. Then within that fiber, there are small heterogeneities and that pulse, of course, gets scattered at those heterogeneities. And so part of the, of the electromagnetic impulse travels back to the interrogation unit and gets recorded there. Then as we deform the fiber, for example, as it gets stretched by a certain distance, of course, those scatterers move a little bit. And this small movement causes a phase delay phi that can be measured by the interrogation unit. And then this phase delay can be translated back into deformation along the fiber. Now, the minimum channel spacing of those stars sensors is about 25 centimeters over tens of kilometer. So that means, for example, you could have with a one meter channel spacing effectively one seismometer or one deformation sensor every meter. And if you have this over one kilometer, you basically have a thousand seismometers. DAS has various potentials. The first obvious one that, that you may easily infer is that you can reach very high spatial resolution at actually a very low cost per channel. The other potential is that we can actually use telecommunication cables that are already exist, meaning that we don't even have to install the cables ourselves. This is, of course, very attractive when you're looking at seismology in urban areas that are densely populated. And if we deploy a cable, it actually turns out that, uh, that quite often, even long cables that are seven, several kilometers long uh, is relatively easy, even in terrain that is difficult to access. And I want to show you a couple of examples. Some of those examples, of course, include glaciers, active volcanoes, but also steep slopes where we may have snow avalanches, rock falls, or other phenomena. So here comes my first case study, and this is from the Rhone Glacier, which I have seen already on the, almost seen on the first slide, uh, located in the Swiss Alps. Here you see one of the iconic, or two iconic photographs of the Rhone Glacier, one to the left taken uh, in 1850 and the other one in 2010. You see that the Rhone Glacier is retreating very rapidly and in fact when we did the experiment this part here of the glacier this was already gone and replaced by a pretty large lake. So the Rhone Glacier is an alpine, is a temperate alpine glacier so it's close to melting temperature actually. Its elevation is between 2200 and 3600 meters and in total it covers about 15 cubic, uh, 15 square kilometers and is about eight kilometers long. Um, what we did is we deploy, deployed a one kilometer long cable in the lower part of the glacier. So it was deployed in this triangular shape that you see to the right. And in each corner of the triangle, we also deployed a standard geophone. So this is all at, uh, at about 2,500 meter altitude. And the important thing here to note is that the deployment of the cable and the deployment of the three seismometers took about the same time, namely about one hour. So this means that uh, in one hour, we had three seismometers and 1,000 DAS channels. A few examples of the, uh, of the signals that we recorded. What is shown in the following pictures are always two traces. They are shifted in time to make them better visible. It's not because they were actually shifted. In black, you see the strain rate from distributed acoustic sensing. So this is a nano strain per second. And in gray, this is the seismometer recording. So this is a velocity recording in nanometer per second. And what you see here with the frequency between one and 30 Hertz is the surface ice quake. So this is an ice quake that occurred very close to the surface, for example, in one of the many crevasses. And uh, what is marked here with the arrows is the radio wave arrival from that, from that ice quake. 
We also performed active tests. So here you see the signal of an explosion, which is at higher frequencies, up to 100 hertz. And we very clearly see a P wave and a Rayleigh wave in both the DAS and the seismometer recording with pretty nice signal to noise ratio. This is the signal of a rockfall. We actually could see those rockfalls with the naked eye. We noted them, so we actually knew where they, uh, know where they, where they occurred. And also here you see that qualitatively, those two recordings are very similar. The signal to noise ratio is very good. Note that you can't compare them wiggle by wiggle because you're looking at two different physical quantities. The seismometer recording is displacement velocity and the dash recording is, is strain rate. What really uh, caught our attention is, however, a different kind of events, namely stick slip ice quakes. So these are ice quakes that occur at the interface between the bedrock and the glacier. We very nicely see P wave arrival, but also an S wave arrival in both the seismometer recordings and the dust. Now, what is interesting and, 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 and most relevant here is that with the help of this dust array, which of course gave us vastly more data than the three seismometers, we could greatly improve the location accuracy of those stick slip events. And this is what you see in the figure to the left. All the green dots are possible, plausible locations of one of these uh, stick slip ice quakes using data from the three seismometers. And you see that it scatters pretty widely, meaning that the actual location of the ice quake cannot be constrained very accurately. However, in contrast, if you use the DAS data, the location of the stick slip ice quake can be constrained to actually within a few meters. Now, during the deployment, which was only one week, we recorded 48 other stick slip ice quakes. And what is interesting is they had nearly identical waveforms with a correlation coefficient uh, regularly between above 0.98. So for all practical purposes, the waveforms were identical. And what the DAS array allows us is, thanks to this high location accuracy, actually infer that all of those ice quakes happen in more or less the same region. So they all belong to the same slip patch, and uh, they also exhibit slip roughly in the direction of the overall flow. So some preliminary conclusions here. Uh, what we have seen, and this is, this is logistically important, is that the deployment of fiber optic cables on glaciers is actually quite easy, uh, and that just covering it with a little bit of snow provides good coupling and data quality that can compete with the seismometer recordings. With a similar logistic effort, basically one hour of work, the DAS array provides greatly improved location accuracy and thereby it allows the inference that all of those stick slip earthquakes that we recorded actually occurred in, in the same cluster within a few meters. The second example I want to show you is, uh, is from, a, from a place that is a little bit more difficult than the Rhone Glacier. It is this Mount Meager in, in Western Canada. So Mount Meager, uh, even though it doesn't look like it, is actually an active volcano. The last eruption is about four and a half thousand years ago. But what Mount Mega is really known for is uh, the largest historic landslide in, uh, in, in recorded Canadian history that just displaced about uh, 50 million cubic meters. What makes uh, Mount Mega also very interesting it has, is that it has the highest geothermal potential within Canada, and it is still partly covered by a glacier that, however, is also retreating quickly. So on one of the ridges of Mount Meager, we deployed a fiber optic cable, which you see in the figure to the right in, in red. This cable was three kilometers long and located at about 2,100 meters above sea level. And in total, this provided 380 channels, so 380 effective seismometer recordings with a spacing of a little bit more than eight meters. This is uh, a fieldwork impression. So this is the campsite. Uh, we also deployed the geophone array in the Mount Mega area. Mount Mega is in the background. It's going to be camped. All the equipment was brought to that ridge uh, using a helicopter. My students had fun as well.
This is uh, the trace of this landslide. You see the, all the trees are missing. To the right, here's this, the glacier or what is left of it. So on the glacier, we trenched the cable using a chainsaw. It looks like fun, but it's actually very serious physical work. Imagine doing this for a distance of two kilometers. That, uh, that takes some time. So again, you see uh, how the landslide cut off all the trees. Okay, so what you see here is the first impression of the data. It's one of the first things we looked at. What you see are 30 minutes of, uh, of data from 15 neighboring channels from December 20th, 2019. And uh, if you look at a single at a single of these channels, it actually looks like noise. But uh, but thanks to the DAS array, you actually have many channels that are sitting next, sitting next to each other. And then you realize that those apparent noise traces are actually equal to each other, essentially wiggle by wiggle. And uh, and this observation is really characteristic for the whole four weeks of of the experiment. So on the one hand, this indicates that instrumental noise obviously plays a small role because instrumental noise would not be coherent between channels and uh, and it shows that what we're actually looking at is uh, is volcanic tremor which as i said using a single seismometer would not have been identified and in fact this volcanic tremor is something that the, the geophones in the area have uh, have not picked up or at least it has has to that point not been not been identified so it's, it's a new feature of that volcano now in addition to uh, to the tremor. We also recorded numerous high frequency events. So this is, uh, this is a movie of all the 350 channels as a function of time. And there you see one of those higher frequency events. So they have a, they have a frequency between about five and 50 Hertz. And within the four weeks of the experiment, we detected about 4,000 of those. And, uh, and this is a level of seismic activity that previously simply had not been known. So uh, again, uh, as on Rhone Glacier, many of these events are very similar. You see here some examples. The example to the left is, is a repeating event that repeats within a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes. Right? So, so you have one waveform that repeats again and again within seconds. And to the right, you have another example. This is also a repeating event, but instead of repeating every couple of seconds, it actually repeats every couple of days, also with almost identical waveforms. Now, it turns out that uh, when you apply beamforming, that most of those events actually fall into, into small clusters that are located in the direction of the main peak of Mount Meager. You, you see some of those event, uh, clusters encircled, each of the, of the dots, is 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 the mo is the most likely uh, most likely uh, location in slowness space it comes from the beam forming, and uh, and what we think is that uh, just as the tremor, these uh, these clusters are related to to geothermal activity, which of course is relevant for future geothermal exploitation of that site. So here again, some preliminary conclusions. Uh, what we have seen here is that. Uh, that also the deployment of a fiber optic cable on an active ice covered volcano is actually quite feasible, even though it's serious physical work. And that uh, trenching and snow cover provide enough coupling to have good quality that actually permits some new geophysical insight. Uh, some of this insight is that, uh, that we have previously unobserved volcanic tremor at relatively low frequency. Also a previously unknown level of seismic activity that really surprised the, uh, the local seismologists. And as I said, this is uh, very important for monitoring of various things, the unsta unstable slopes, geothermal energy exploitation, and so on and so forth.
Now this brings me to, to the last site, to the last um, case study that I want to present. And this is one of the more recent ones. This is from Grimswörten in, in Iceland. What you see on that picture here is actually the ash cloud of, from the last major eruption in 2011. That ash cloud reached a height of about 12 kilometers. Uh, and of course had uh, a significant impact on, on aviation and, uh, and, and of the, the local climate. So Grimswörten is, uh, is actually Iceland's most active and also one of the largest volcanoes. As I have just shown, the most recent eruption was in 2011. The caldera, which you see here in the, in the center, has a diameter of 10 kilometers. So it is, a, it is a very large volcano. It is covered entirely by Europe's largest glacier, Vatnajökull, and Jökull. Uh, and underneath the glacier, which is uh, and in that place about three, 400 meters thick, there's a subglacial caldera lake that is heated and kept fluid by, by geothermal volcanic heating. Grimswörten poses uh, serious natural hazards, uh, mostly through flooding, but also ash clouds, and there is, uh, there is a climate impact, uh, especially from, from more historic eruptions that were significantly larger than the one in 2011. So on Grimswörten, we deployed a 12 kilometer long fiber optic cable. You see this here in the figure in, in black. So it follows the caldera rim and it actually goes to the central point of the caldera. What we did there was really blue sky research. We didn't have a real research object objective. We were just curious. We wanted to see if such an experiment is actually possible at all. Can it be done? What kind of signal maybe record? Um, can we improve earthquake detection and location? And, uh, and also we wanted to know if we can actually detect signals that the regional seismometer network does not pick up. And, uh, and especially my, my PhD student, Sarah, was very interested in figuring out why the caldera of Grimswörten actually looks like Mickey Mouse. So. Here are some fieldwork expressions. Um, we deployed a cable with the help of colleagues from Iceland who built a sled that we used for trenching. So this is what you see here. So the cable here comes out of a piston bully that I also, you know, like it's used on ski slopes. And then it goes into a plow. The plow goes to about half a meter depth and then comes out in the back and the cables then trench to about 50 centimeter depth. The oil barrel that you can see on the sled was just in order to have to have a more significant weight in order to get into the ice. This is what this looked like in practice. So the piston bully had the cable drum in the back. Here's, you see the cable drum. The cable goes into the plow on the sled and then comes out and, uh, within the ice at a depth of about half a meter. Some, some other impressions. Uh, this is a sundowner uh, on the caldera of Grimswörten. We actually had a real sundowner with cocktails, uh, so the Icelanders know how to party, I can tell you that. Um, and the interrogator was located in one of these research huts that you see here to the right, that we had electricity and internet and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course also, and that's important in Iceland, a volcanically heated sauna. Uh, this is the central point of the caldera where the cable ended. So basically here at that point where my PhD students are, are digging, there's, a, there's 300 meters of ice below them, and then there's about 150 meters of water in this subglacial lake. This is an impression from the data that we recorded. This is quite typical. These are 40 seconds of data from May 7th, 2021. And you see two things in this recording. You see at first a small local earthquake. This is at higher frequencies, and you see that this has a pretty high amplitudes on the order of about 100 200 nanostrain per second. It, it is high frequency. And of these earthquakes, local earthquakes, we detected about uh, 1,000 per week. And, uh, and this is important here. This is about uh, two orders of magnitude more earthquake detections than provided by the regional seismometer network. Um, what is also interesting and what caught our attention are these continuous oscillations that you see within the caldera. So you see this, this uh, monochromatic up and down. Uh, it turns out that this signal is omnipresent. 
it's there for the whole duration of the experiment, the whole three weeks, and it has a frequency that is almost exactly 0.22 hertz. And uh, it only weakly correlates with the ambient seismic wave field. So what we see actually here is we see resonance of this floating ice sheet. And so so the, the, the geometry here is as follows. We have those 300 meters of ice below 150 meters of water in the subglacial lake. And the, and the ice sheet is moving up and down with a period of about five seconds. And, uh, and the strain rates that we observe over this large distance of the, of the caldera corresponds to a movement of about 0.5 meters up and down every five seconds. So, so what we have is actually a standing flexural wave that causes extension and compression at the surface where the dust cable was located. Here's an impression of the spectrum of, uh, of those oscillations. So what you see uh, is the, uh, the amplitude spectrum of the dust channels located inside the caldera. And the color coding corresponds to time. So black is the hour just, the, just after midnight. And as you go to lighter colors, you're getting more into the day. So the light gray is, uh, is around noon. And you see, uh, as I said, that this is a very narrow spectral peak and that the spectral amplitude hardly varies over time. Now, what is interesting is, the, is that the shape of the spectral peak can be approximated very closely by the spectrum of a damped harmonic oscillator with a Q value of about 15. And, uh, and it turns out that uh, not only on May 7th, but throughout the experiment, the spectrum does not vary much, does not vary very much. So in contrast, this is what the spectrum of, uh, of ambient seismic noise looks like. So this is taken from a coastal station in Iceland. This is called KVI. Now that our DAS cable is here. And, uh, and it's the same day and the same time, the same time intervals, midnight and then around noon. And you see that first of all, ambient noise has a much broader spectrum. And it also varies much more significantly over time. In this case here, the spectral amplitude varied by a factor of about three within only two hour, uh, within only 20 hour, uh, 12 hours. So you see that, uh, that we are really looking at two different phenomena, even though they occur in, in somewhat similar frequency bands. So it turns out that we can invert for the, for the effective driving forces of this resonance. So the, the driving, so the forces that keep this resonance going as a function of time, despite the relatively high attenuation. So we have a Q value of only 15. And, uh, and the result of those, or those driving forces in the frequency, in the time frequency domain are what you see here. So we have frequency on the Y axis, the days from the beginning of the experiment on the X axis. And what we see is the, the spectral amplitude of the effective forces. And you see that low frequency sources that are not ambient noise are basically present all the time, sometimes they're a bit stronger, sometimes they're a bit weaker. And we think that what we actually observe here is volcanic tremor, continuous volcanic tremor that is related to geothermal activity. So again, here are some preliminary conclusions. Um, we saw that uh, the DAS deployment very clearly outperforms the local seismometer array when it comes to the detection of high frequency earthquakes, but also when it comes to the observation of this previously unknown ice sheet resonance. This resonance, interestingly, uh, acts, uh, as a, acts as an amplifier of a signal that otherwise would not be visible. So this tremor really becomes visible because we have this amplifier, this natural amplifier. And, and we think that this might actually, might actually offer interesting opportunities for, for somewhat exotic monitoring of volcanoes that have uh, a similar setting, so an, an ice sheet floating on top of a, of a subglacial lake. Now, this brings me to, to part two of my talk, which is on emerging integrated fiber optic sensing technologies. So what you have seen before was distributed acoustic sensing. So distributed means here is that we can make deformation or strain measurements as a function of position. And so, so we get, for example, a strain rate measurement every meter or whatever our channel spacing is. Integrated fiber optic sensing, in contrast, 
is not distributed, but provides a measurement of deformation that is literally integrated along an optical fiber. Now, why is this useful? This should become clear uh, on this slide. And uh, so the motivation for this integrated acoustic sensing is really that the, the maximum interrogation distance of distributed acoustic sensing is quite limited. And it is limited si simply because the amplitudes of those backscattered pulses are naturally quite weak. And, uh, and as you go to larger distances, they attenuate even more, they have to travel further. And as a consequence, most available DAS units, either commercially or academically, have a maximum interrogation distance of about 40 kilometers. This is what the vendors tell you, but it's also something that we figured out in actual experiments. At around 40 kilometers, this is the end of the story. Um, so an alternative to this are transmission-based systems. I right? recall that the range of data is limited because we are looking at those weak backscattered signals. So why don't we look directly at the transmitted signal that is propagating through this fiber? So, uh, so what those transmit transmission-based systems do, they, they still feed an optical pulse, a laser pulse, into one end of the fiber and then record it at the other end. And, uh, and that uh, the pulse that arrives here will have a certain phase, which is uh, phi of t. Right? So if you, it's, it's a function of t because if you send another pulse at a slightly later time, the phase might be a different one. Now you deform the fiber, and, and as a consequence, the, uh, the length of the fiber changes, and also the refractive index of the fiber changes. And so you have two effects. The travel distance changes, but also as a consequence of, uh, of strain, you change the reflective index, so the speed of light within the fiber. And the consequence is that those pulses that travel through the fiber acquire a, fall, a small phase change, delta phi, as a function of time. Now you can do a little bit of math, it's, uh, it's not difficult, and you find out that this delta phi that we are measuring here is actually proportional to the strain integrated along the fiber. And so it's not strain at a certain position, but it's strain at all of the position along, positions along the fiber and then integrated. So this has advantages and disadvantages. The, the disadvantage is that, well, it's an integrated measurement. And so it seems like you actually have no spatial resolution, and this is simply the price you pay for having a longer reach. But on the other hand, the upside is that uh, with this equation, we can actually directly compare the DAS measurements to those integrated measurements. Because what DAS gives us, it gives us exactly this strain along the fiber. And so we can plug our DAS measurements into that integral and then compute those integrated measurements. We can, we can synthesize them and then compare to actual integrated measurements from a device that transmits or that sends in and receives those transmitted pulses. And this is what we did together with colleagues in, in Athens, uh, Adonis Bogris, Thomas Nikas and, uh, and a few others. And they are actually um, um, the, the, the fiber optic scientists, and they built such a device that performs this integrated measurement. So what we did is we installed uh, their interrogator, the integrated interrogator, and our distributed acoustic sensing in a suburb of Athens. And then we hooked it up to a telecommunication cable that traverses the northern suburbs of Athens for a distance of about 30 kilometers. What you see here is a typical earthquake recording from the experiment that ran for about a month in, in September and October 2021. So on the y-axis we have, we have uh, on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis there's distance along the cable, and the colors are strain rate measured by all of the dust channels that had a spacing of about 8 meters over those roughly 30 kilometers. And then what we did is we integrated 
those task measurements along distance. And this gives us the blue, the blue recording. And we compared this to the actual integrated sensing that the colleagues in Athens did with their interrogator. And there you see that they actually compare very well in a lower frequency band of about uh, 0, 0, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 hertz. We can also look at higher frequencies. So this is 0.1 to 5 hertz. And even there you see that uh, the actual measurement and the measurement synthesized from the DAS data actually compares almost wiggle by wiggle. Yeah, so um, so this, this was very encouraging. It basically tells us that this integrated measurement has a very high quality and it really provides provides data that, that, that are solid and that can be used for, for quantitative geophysical inferences. But a quick big question here is that there's actually anything that can be done in order to, to transform this integrated measurement or to give those integrated measurements some sort of spatial resolution. So can we do anything in order to obtain some sort of distributed information from those measurements that are inherently integrated. And it turns out that, that this is possible. So if you do a little bit of math, it turns out that this first equation that I have shown you, that this uh, integrated phase delay is an integral over strain, has a partner that is exactly equivalent. And that tells us that the phase change as a function of time is an integral over fiber curvature times displacement of the fiber. So what this means is that inherently parts of the fiber that are more strongly curved are more sensitive to deformation than other parts of the fiber that are less curved. And here you see an example, it's a synthetic one. We have a source at the position of the black, sky, black star and that source radiates a wave field of which you see a snapshot here. And then we have two cables, one in black and one in red, located to the left. Now the black cable has a total length of about 2000 kilometers, and it produces the phase delay recording that you see here in black. Now one thing that you see already is that even though we have a single wave front, we actually have two wiggles, two pairs of wiggles in this phase change recording. Now the red fiber has a much shorter length. It's only about 1000 kilometer long. And it also produces a phase change measurement that you see here in red. Again, we see two wiggles, even though we only had one wave front. But what is also interesting is that actually the amplitude here for the short fiber is about the same as for the long fiber. And the reason simply is that even though the short fiber is shorter, it is more strongly curved. And that strong curvature offsets or compensates the, uh, the, short, the short length of the fiber. And as a consequence, this phase change measurement has a similar amplitude than we have for the long fiber. So, uh, so here again, and the statement that strongly curved fiber segments are more sensitive to deformation and they actually produce individual distinguishable wiggles. And this is something that we can exploit for our purposes. And here's how this goes. So the question we asked ourselves was, how does, for example, the arrival time of one of these individual wiggles, so within a certain time window, actually depend on the structure of the Earth? So what we did is we put a window here, window A, around one of those wiggles. We measured the travel time of that wiggle, and then we apply, applied the adjoint method in order to compute a sensitivity kernel. And that sensitivity kernel is what you see, to, uh, what you see here uh, in, in red and blue. So what that sensitivity kernel tells you is in which parts of this two-dimensional Earth model you, you can or you have to change the p-velocity in order to make that particular wiggle here in that window arrive later or earlier. Now we can pick other time windows. For example, if we pick this time window, we see that 
suddenly we are sensitive to different parts of the earth and it's uh, it's different fiber segments this one and this one that are responsible for that window right? whereas only this one was responsible for the window that we had before we can carry this a little bit further uh, if we pick yet another time window window c and we see that this time window is made by this high curvature segment of the fiber if we choose another time window back here then we see that mostly this high curvature fiber segment is responsible for this time window and so on and so forth so what this means is that by actually analyzing those integrated measurements within different time windows we can effectively mimic distributed measurements yeah? so we can infer spatially resolved information about different parts of the earth even though we are making an integrated measurement that at first sight apparently does not have any spatial resolution so this brings me to some final conclusions i'm i'm running out of time uh, the first one concerning distributed sensing is that uh, logistically the deployment of long cables 10 kilometers or more in volcan volcanic and or glacial environments is actually quite feasible even though it's of course physically challenging uh, it provides a coverage that traditional end instruments could simply not provide at least not with uh, any reasonable effort in contrast to what many people say we find that the data quality can actually be very good it can if properly shielded from the atmosphere for, for sure compare uh, compete with the data quality that you would get from a reasonably well installed geophone so far our focus has been on characterization and detection of seismicity so that is improvements of location accuracy to the point where we can actually see clusters that before with less location accuracy would actually not have been resolved uh, also typically a vastly increased number of detected events by one or two orders of magnitude in the case studies that we looked at and we also see previously unknown forms of events or deformation for example volcanic tremor or this interesting uh, caldera resonance that we saw in iceland now concerning this integrated sensing in contrast to the distributed one uh, what it does, it uh, provides measurements of deformation-induced phase changes of transmitted and not of backscattered laser pulses. Those technologies, they're still under development. Uh, it's a hot research topics, uh, topic in fiber optics, but uh, really the first comparison of this prototype to the much more mature uh, distributed acoustic sensing was really very promising. What we managed to do is we can actually mimic some sort of distributed measurement simply by analyzing those integrated measurements as a function of time and we think that this really opens the door towards uh, use of this technology for example in seismic tomography or earthquake location and this is all i have thank you very much for your attention and i'm open to questions Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. It's, uh, you've shown us a lot, and it's a lot of very interesting stuff. And we have, in fact, a few questions, so I would like to pose those to you. Uh, uh, I have one from uh, Pauline Kruiver, who says, Thus, on volcano is impressive, but what if there's no snow cover? How to ensure that there is good coupling between the fiber optic cable and the ground? Yes, so, so actually we had this on Mount Meager. Uh, so Mount Mir, um, two kilometers were on ice, and we did that with the chainsaw. And uh, and on the volcano where there was no ice, we actually trenched. So uh, so we used uh, shovels and pickaxes, and uh, and did that for for one kilometer. Uh, a volcano uh, like Mount Meager um, makes this actually quite possible because um, because it's not very consolidated. So it was it was relatively loose rock. So the trenching with, with pickaxes and shovels was actually quite possible. And, and we trenched to about 20 centimeter depth, uh, one kilometer within about one day. So uh, indeed, if there would be no snow at all, then you would 
you would uh, if the ground is more consolidated, would you then bury it more, or would you? Uh... So, so, so you have to find a way of shielding the cable from the atmosphere. And so, so trenching is the obvious thing if you can. And so, uh, our experience is that if you absolutely cannot trench the cable, and if it's just lying at the surface, exposed to temperature variations and more importantly to wind, then it data quality is is miserable so this is this is really needed and uh, and trend yeah tre trenching or um, I may, maybe now I understand your question uh, when there's no snow cover yeah you, you have to trench and in our experience is that trenching to about 10 to 10 to 20 centimeters is enough maybe um... I can uh, remind to the attendees that they can unmute themselves. So if they want to continue the discussion. So if Pauline want to interact, she can uh, just unmute herself. Uh, if not, then I would like to go on to Jaap Mont, who has a few questions. Uh, Jaap, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask them directly? Uh, Pauline seems to be unable to mute herself. Uh, Diego? Okay, I will unmute them uh, then. Uh, Pauline, I think you are unmuted now. Yes, I am unmuted now. I, I could not uh, press the button. It was uh, great. Well, I, I will do it for you then. Okay. Okay, so I was thank you very much, uh, um, Andreas. It was very, very interesting talk, and it's good to hear that trenching for only ten to twenty centimeters is sufficient because uh, uh, otherwise it would be really a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, shall I then also ask my second question? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Go ahead. Because for for the second part for the integrated sensing, uh, well, I I think. My question is, do you need two interrogators for that one at each end? Uh, so, um, this, this, this would be a possible setup. What the colleagues in Athens did, they actually used the loop. So, uh, so the, the cable went 30 kilometers in one direction and then looped back. Oh, okay. and, uh, and that made sure that, uh, that you could directly compare the, uh, the, 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 transmitted, the transmitted signal to an incoming signal and so you could you could correlate them directly without having timing issues right so this this is the bigger challenge so yeah so so you need you need a, an emitter and you need a receiver but the real challenge when they're not sitting in the same place is that you need to synchronize them yeah. and uh, and to avoid this uh, synchronization problem at the moment they're using loops so uh, so all the devices are sitting on a single anti-verbation table in the lab. Yeah, smart solution. Thank you. They are very smart people. I was really impressed. They built this interrogator. It uh, it costs about two orders of magnitude less than a commercial DAS interrogator. Um, and they built it from, from off-the-shelf um, optoelectronic uh, components. Very, very impressive. Yes, great to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, Diego, could you please unmute Jaap Mont? Here we go. Yeah, right, thank you. Yes, yeah. this is me. Um, I have a question related to the Rhone Glacier. Mm -hmm. Could you also determine the slip direction? Uh, yes, so we could actually determine the slip direction. Uh, we uh, we do have moment transfer solutions for those uh, for those thick slip earthquakes, uh, ice quakes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and uh, yeah, the the, uh, the the motion is in direction is in the direction of flow. Okay. So, so through the thick slip events, the glacier is moving downhill. Okay. Uh, the other question, if I may, is that if I would like to do a similar survey for Groningen to accurately determine the locations where the micro seismicity happens and where the maybe the fault is slipping and then the direction, what sort of layout for the survey would be needed 
as it is at the depth of about say three kilometers. I think you would. I mean, you're, you're locating events, so I think you have the same problem that you have when you deploy seismometers. And uh, and if you if you're free, if you were free to deploy a cable, you know, without any uh, any human-made boundary conditions, of you know, uh, I would probably deploy it in a spiral. You know, something that gives you good azimuthal coverage. So so. It's, you know, with those source locations, always the same. You need azimuthal coverage in order to locate them with high accuracy. But there's no difference. And, uh, and you get that by some sort of circular arrangements, for example, in a, yeah, a single circle or a spiral. That's what I would probably choose. Okay. And would it be giving a better result than when you would be sort of using geophones in a spiral configuration? So the advantage, so. It depends a little bit on what limits on what limits the location accuracy. Right? So, so in case location accuracy is limited by your knowledge about 3D Earth structure, then a denser array may not help you. No. If your knowledge, if it's if it's if your if your location accuracy is limited by coverage, then it will help you because you can have a vastly denser coverage than you can possibly achieve with geophones. So for those commercially available devices, the spatial sampling, so the, the channel spacing can be 25 centimeters. And so it depends a little bit on the specifics of the problem. What is the actual limitation of location accuracy? Is it, is it earth model limited or is it data limited? And if it's data limited, then I think the DAS array can really bring an advantage. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Jaap. Uh, then I also see that Menno Buisman has a question. Diego, could you unmute Menno? He's unmuted. Yes, thank you, Andres, for the presentation. <laughs> Hello, Menno. I was wondering, uh, one question would be whether the interrogator has to be looped, but you already answered that one, um, because also this transmitted interrogator would be interesting, I think, to improve the time sampling. Because I, I was wondering, uh, one thing would be, can you improve then the time sampling? Because right now, often it's limited to 100 kilohertz and you're limited then, yeah, it's a trade-off between fiber length and yes. time sampling. Yeah. And the other question for me would be, have you also tried uh, non-coherent laser uh, sources? So, yeah, then you're no longer uh, limited by pulse width. Yeah. And then you can also extend the range. Yeah, so, so actually with DAS, uh, we are far away from 100 kilohertz. So, uh, so the highest one, the highest sampling frequency that we can do with ours uh, is about 10 kilohertz. Um, and as you said correctly, then you run into issues with the, um, with the length of the cable. The longer your cable is, the lower your sampling rate can be because you simply have to wait for the backscattered pulses to come back. Um, so for the, uh, for the integrated measurement, yes, uh, it would be possible to increase the sampling rate because you do not have that limitation that comes from the length of the cable. And, uh, and the colleagues are actually thinking about this. Um, to, so, so one of their ideas is to have a sampling rate that is so high that it allows distributed measurements. I don't know exactly how that technology works, but just, yeah, but you can increase this very significantly. Um, then, of course, you might have other issues with uh, signal to noise ratio and so on and so forth that I, I don't know about. And concerning uh, incoherent uh, laser signals, no, I mean, um, we only have used two systems. So the one the, is, is the, this commercial IDAS from Sedixa that, that we're using, and the other one is the system that the colleagues in Athens produced, and it's both coherent. Okay, thank you. Looking forward to see those uh, transmitted uh, interrogators. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I think we will see them within the next couple of years, for sure. All right, Menno, thank you for the question. Um, then I also see that Case Hornman has a question. So uh, if Case could be muted. Yes, I'm muted. So, uh, Thank you for your presentation. I enjoyed that. 
Uh, my question was regarding the mimicking of distributed sensing from integrated sensing. You show that in a picture with a, a two-dimensional plane where the curvature, the curved cable, is in the plane of the ray parameter between source and your cable. Does that, but suppose that the source is perpendicular above the cable or below that cable, then there is no curvature there anymore in that direction. This is Does correct. that mean that your technique would only be applicable for surface sources? Um, I would not say it's only applicable, but it will work less, uh, less well. So, so here, the, the crux of the problem, which you in a way already realize, is that curvature is a vectorial quantity in this case. So actually what we're looking at is, is, the, is the normal vector of this, uh, of this fiber. And, uh, and what, we, what we have actually here in this equation, fiber curvature times displacement is actually a vector product. So it's strictly speaking, it's a non-normalized normal vector and the dot product of that with the displacement field. So if your displacement field uh, is orthogonal to the normal vector of the fiber, then you would not record a phase change. So that means in ex exactly as you said in your configuration, if you put that source out of the plane, then this fiber would not record the P wave, but it would record the S waves. Because in that case, the S wave, which is not shown here, uh, the S wave would actually have a polarization that is parallel to the normal vector, and therefore it would actually produce a phase change signal. And so it's it's similar as for 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 conventional distributed acoustic sensing, where you have a directional sensitivity, where directional means both direction of the fiber and its interplay with the direction of the polarization. So depending on how they how they're arranged, you may record P waves more or S waves more, and so on and so forth. Right, thank you. Yes, and indeed, and for ordinary DAS recordings, then they came up with the idea of a, a helically shaped cable. So I already see that your next step will be here, a three-dimensionally curved cable in order to see that in all directions. So, so, so the thing is actually here for this, uh, I think you could figure out what the measurement in the end actually means. Uh, for DAS, when it comes to helically wound fibers or cables, the concern is always what exactly is the measurement? Uh, you, you may see more wiggles that correspond to P waves and to S waves, but their quantitative interpretation becomes very, very difficult. Right. Okay. They're excessively heavy and expensive, which is why they are hardly used. So for actually field deployments, as we do, uh, helically wound cable is completely useless. You just can't carry it. I understand. Thank you. It's, thank you very much, uh, Case. And then I think we have uh, time for one final question, which is actually from one of our panel members, namely uh, Hannes Kutscha. So, Hannes, uh, would you like to ask Andreas your question? Uh, yes, thank you. So, uh, but the question just has been uh, answered a little bit. Uh, so, my question was if these uh, cables can be used uh, more in, uh, yeah, what happens when the signal comes from uh, perpendicular to the cable? Uh, so, how much would that limit you? But I think you just answered this question. <laughs> in that, in that case, I have a final question. <laughs> so, uh, I saw you mentioned the flexural ice wave, which is an old uh, friend of mine because I was uh, working on this on uh, Arctic acquisitions, and I was wondering if you could uh, use uh, the information of the dispersion of this wave to localize the events. Um, the dispersion of which wave? of the flexural ice wave. The, oh, if you could use the dispersion of those flexural waves. Yeah, to localize events, because uh, this is what uh, um, what it could happen with the guided waves, is that there is a strong relation between uh, the geometry, the location of, uh, of your source, and uh, the dispersion of this wave. These are uh, very highly dispersive waves. Okay. Yeah, um, so in this case, I don't think it's possible because the because the frequencies are too low. 
right? So, so we are here in a situation where the, where the wavelength is about 10 kilometers, and that is about the size of the whole system. So, okay. uh, so we're actually not looking at a dispersed traveling wave. We're looking at a standing fundamental mode. Okay, I see. And, uh, and with that, uh, we can't really localize. localize. And, uh, and it seems like all the, the higher modes or anything that would travel is not excited, or at uh, least not measurable. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, I believe that's all the questions we've had uh, so far. So uh, I think, Andreas, thank you very much again for not uh, only taking time to present, but to answer all of these questions. Uh, I mean, Thanks a lot. Everybody, yeah, indeed, it's it's really great that you took the time out of this. I know you're very busy. Yeah, thanks for thanks again for the invitation. It was really a pleasure. Um, uh, yeah. I... Thanks and have a have a good weekend. Thank you, Andreas. I will take uh, other, uh, just one minute to uh, advertise our next event. Uh, it will be the 13th of April. Uh, it's co-hosted with uh, our friends of the local chapter Germany, and uh, uh, it will be about uh, multi-method imaging in environmental geophysics with uh, Professor Florian Wagner from uh, Aachen University giving this talk. And uh, my very final uh, slide is, as usual, the acknowledgments. And uh, here I thank again uh, Andreas for his presentation and to be with us uh, uh, for this event. Uh, but also I would like to thank uh, Aranko for, for providing the WebEx event a platform and the other local chapter for uh, uh, their participation. And with this, um, yeah, I close the, the event, stop recording now, and uh, I wish you a very good weekend as well. Bye-bye.